We're talking today about the post-classical period in world history, its general contours. It's a period that runs from about 500 CE to about 1450 CE. You could argue maybe a little later. You could argue 1450, give or take. But we're talking about roughly not quite a thousand year span of the human experience. The purpose of our discussion today is to talk about the general nature of this period, what its basic themes were. And I'm going to begin at risk of a little personalization by talking about the way this period looked when I first became engaged in world history on a high school project some years back. When we were thinking about how to block out the project, and none of us was all that experienced in world history at that point, we had a lot of fun with the river valleys and we could talk about the classical civilizations. And then when we got to the more modern era, we were in good shape. But for this block, we really didn't know what to say. So I think we stumbled around something like age of separations or age of incoherence or some nonsense that suggested that all we could do for this period was to tell a whole batch of separate stories and hope that people didn't get bored and hope that people didn't realize we had no basic themes at all. Well, in point of fact, the post-classical period is one of the periods that has been most reshaped by world history work, not mine, that of others. And it is indeed one of the most exciting periods to try to teach. But before we talk about what the positive themes are, a couple of words on why it used to seem, and maybe to some people still seems, like this is a particularly confused stage of the human experience. There are two reasons. Most obviously, and this simply has to be grappled with, the geographical territory now organized in civilization, civilization as a form of human organization, as we've discussed it earlier, the territory now expands greatly. So you're talking about much larger stretches of geography than was, than was true for the classical period. At the same time, no matter how you cut the cake, the number of separate civilizations also has to be expanded. In the classical period, obviously, we got by with three or four basic foci. Can't do that for the post-classical. You've got to have more cases, and we'll talk about that during the course of our discussion in this session. So the superficial reason that the, class, the post-classical period seems complicated is not really all that superficial, there are more cases, there are greater complexities. The second reason, however, that this period can seem off-putting is because in the European history tradition, this period is exactly the period known as the Middle Ages, the medieval period. We don't use that word for the whole world in world history because the connotations are just wrong. But the European Middle Ages were always themselves a bit of a catch-all. The implication was that after the glories of Greece and Rome and before the glories of the Renaissance, there was this somewhat awkward stretch of the European experience where you could ultimately talk about some growing strengths and revivals, but much of which was defined as a bit of a civilizational wasteland. Well, for world history, this is a non-starter. The post-classical period was a period of great dynamism, all sorts of major innovations, all sorts of extremely vigorous societies, and medieval Europe would be only a small part, at the end a growing part, but a small part of this larger experience. To the extent, though, that we're still trapped in notions of Middle Ages, of uh, lack of vigor, of, of civilizational deterioration, uh, this may color our view of this period, but this one's easy. Just throw it away, start over. The post-classical period is different. Periodization, and we're talking and trying to define the classical post-classical period, we're talking about periodization. Periodization is the historian's key analytical tool. And when we introduce a new period in world history, in United States history, wherever, if we're analytically honest, we're trying to say this, there is a change in framework so that the framework that had described the human experience or the relevant chunk of experience previously no longer is front and center. A different framework replaces it and developments and changes within this new period would work within this new framework until the period itself ends and yields to another. So without belaboring the technicalities here, when we introduce a new period, 
we owe our audience three things. One, we need to say clearly and hopefully prove that the themes of the previous period no longer have dominant operation. They may still be a factor, but they're no longer dominant. Two, we need to say when the new period comes into play, and also at the other end, when it stops being particularly salient. And then three, and this is the most important part, we need to say what the new themes are, in the world history case, what the themes are to which other major societies, most major societies, will have to react. All right, point one, hopefully easy. We did some of this last time. The end of the classical period, the fall of the great classical empires, means that we no longer look primarily to the processes of expansion of China, India, and the Mediterranean, and the integration devices these societies would develop to try to hold these expanded territories together. Uh, the remnants of this effort are still quite visible, but the effort itself is no longer predominant. China and India are essentially established. They'll change, but you no longer have to talk about expansion that will create the geographical framework for China or the basic integrating devices, the institutions of empire, Confucianism, that will be used to hold it together. They're already there. Same basically for India with Hinduism and the caste system. And you're certainly not going to talk in this new period about the continued expansion and integration of the classical Mediterranean because it's burst apart. So, first point, hopefully easily established, the old themes, their mark is still there, but the old themes are no longer dominant. Second point, the chronological boundaries. Pretty obviously, the beginning of the post-classical period is marked first by the fall of Han China, Gupta India, and the Roman Empire. And second, on a more positive note, by the emergence of the Arabs and Islam as a new force in world history. There are important centers of activity besides the Arabs and Islam during the post-classical period. Notably, the Byzantine Empire would have a significant voice in affairs in the Eastern Mediterranean and in Eastern Europe. And China would revive to play a major role in East Asia. But in the post-classical period, beginning indeed around 600, the Arabs, with their new religion of Islam, emerge as a major force in world history, and Arab Islamic civilization really becomes the first world-class civilization that we have dealt with in world history thus far. In the classical period, you could haggle a bit about which of the three major centers was primarily influential. Probably India would win because it had the greatest commercial and cultural outreach, but it's not a very sensible discussion. But in the bulk of the post-classical period, the vigor, activities, outreach of Islam and the Arab world really carry much of the story of world history and the other developments in places like the Byzantine Empire and China need to be seen alongside this central dynamic. Correspondingly, much of the end of the post-classical period is described in terms of the uh, reduction of Arab vigor, not the decline of the Arabs so much as a reduction in vigor, noteworthy particularly a political deterioration, but also some changes in cultural and economic roles that we will detail in due course. This reduction of the Arab role, uh, becoming particularly marked by the 13th century, would be followed by a couple of centuries of sort of end of the post-classical period experimentation, notably a new vigorous if short sub-period, the Mongol period, and a few other experiments that we will talk about as we near the end of the experience. So, the post-classical period in terms of power dynamics is particularly shaped by the rise of the Arabs and Islam, and then a later point marked by the beginnings of a reduction in the role of the Arabs, not so much a reduction in Islam's role, a reduction in the role of the Arabs, and a couple of intermediate systems introduced at the end of the period that will take us up to 1450. That's for the chronological dimensions. Now, as I noted already, and is obvious from any cursory knowledge of the period, there's no question.